Okay, our next talk will be about deploying random AI models from Pip Nightmare to Dream Tunix. Let's welcome Yorick. Give him a round of applause. I have my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about my adventure in deploying generative AI models to random clouds. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Yorick. I started using Nexos in 2014. Um, this is my second talk here. Last year, I spoke about the C API. Um, I've worked everywhere. I've worked at Cirocco, I've worked at Tweak, I've worked at Lumiguide. Um, last year, after the C API talk, I started a company, um, Datakami, where we um, help uh, startups that have generative AI as their core product to deploy and scale. Um, as part of that, sometimes we have to deploy generative AI models. Um, so what do I mean with the generative AI model? I mean some bunch of code, um, numbers, weights that are sometimes tens or hundreds or gigabytes. Uh, they take uh, text, images, video, audio, and they output some other text images, video, audio, that are somehow related to that. Um, examples of that are um, Whisper for speech-to-text, uh, ChatGPT for text-to-text, -text, um, Lava for image plus text-to-text, -text. so you have an image, you can ask questions about it. And um, as part of my company, I wanted to be able to run these models somewhere in the cloud uh, on my own. So. What does one of those models look like? Um, basically, it's a bunch of Python code, usually. There's a paper, they have some repository link, um, they have a bunch of academic code, uh, they have a demo, maybe. Um, the, the, they, have, um, they generally use Torch uh, with a bunch of other dependencies, so you're meant to just pip install it and then go, and it works when they release the paper, and then Somewhat later, maybe it still works. Hopefully, it still works. You uh, start to get into debugging territory. Um, they upload their weights on a website called Hugging Face, where you can just upload hundreds of gigabytes of numbers for free. Uh, the dependencies are not great. So you have um, really weird packages, specific versions of it. It's only tested on that. Um, it works if you pip install it, as I said, but it doesn't work if you maybe um, Poetry lock it and then install it. Um, there's a bunch of issues with all of these dependencies where they expect really specific environments or hardware. And then we want to deploy this to the cloud. So what do I mean with the cloud? Um, these things run on uh, GPUs, um, very expensive GPUs. We don't want to buy one of those GPUs to run it because that uh, gets quite expensive and you generally want to have this run as um, user um, based on a user action. Um, fortunately, there are some companies where you can rent GPUs by the minute. So as you can see, there are some companies you can uh, rent an H100 T GPU for $3 per hour. Of course, you don't want to have that on all day if it's not necessary, but you also want to have it start fast so you can uh, respond to user input quickly. Um, all of these clouds work with Docker images, sadly. Uh, it's the standard, so it makes sense, but I don't like it. So the simple way to take one of these models and um, uh, put it on the cloud is like this. You write the Docker file, you take some base image, you run pip install, uh, you give it the port that it runs at, hopefully there's a demo, otherwise you have to write some of your own co code. Uh, this works when you're reasonably close to the release of the model, then later maybe it doesn't, uh, or it works and then someone else has to modify a bit and it has to pip install all of your dependencies again. So you start maybe building more layers of pip installs where you only change the relevant bits. It's, uh, it's not great, or it only builds if you have to write uh, layers in cache. Um, of course, we are at Nixcon, so um, I had a better idea. I came up with a plan to do this with Nix, um, our favorite tool, of course. Um, so the plan has 
four steps. I don't know the third one yet, but the first one is uh, package Python using Nix. Um, just take all of those uh, random dependencies, um, have an easy way to turn that into a Python environment as a Nix derivation, and then use that to generate the Docker image. And then hopefully uh, we are all happy. So the first step, how do you package Python easily in Nix? Um, I first looked at the upstream Nix packages infrastructure. So there is a Python packages in Nix packages, of course. And they have one version of everything. Hopefully, for us, it's the right version. It's probably not the right version. You have to um, package things manually. But it does have all of the patches to make your packages compatible with Nix, so that's nice. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, I found it to be too much manual labor. Um, so then there is poetry to Nix. Uh, we all know and love it. It's uh, written at Tweak uh, during my time there, so I'm a bit familiar with it. I mean, I hope I'm right. So <laughs> I see someone shaking their head. But anyways, um, it's better than pip. You do poetry lock, you get a lock file, and you can build that in the future. Uh, but it's not entirely the same as pip. So if you do poetry lock and then install, you hopefully get the same packages as pip, but it's not really guaranteed. And they don't really try it. They just give you a good set of dependencies that might not be the one that you expected. If you commit the poetry lock file, then later it works, of course, for everyone. But it's not, it's not great. We could use it if we had to. But I looked a bit further in the wiki about packaging Python um, packages. And there was something about MacNix. Um, MacNix was written a few years ago by Duff Howe. Um, if you look at the readme, it says, um, don't use the, well, this is deprecated and it's being replaced by dream 2 nix Then you go to the dream 2 nix uh, readme and it says, this is being replaced by a rewrite of dream 2 nix um, So I went to the, to the readme for the rewrite for dream 2 nix and it says, this is unstable software. Um, <laughs> But I persisted, I continued. I had some people tell me, yes, this is great. You should use this. And now I agree. So uh, the documentation is quite good. Uh, sometimes it changes. That's what it means with unstable software, but I can live with that. Um, it uses a module system, so it uses the same module system as Nixos. And um, it is a way to automate uh, reproducible packaging for various langu language ecosystems. So it lives in a GitHub repository, I think, on Next Community. It's also written by Dav Howe, um, who is hopefully here. I'm not sure. Um, it uses a module system to do all of this. As I said, um, it uh, basically, for all of the supported languages, has a way to generate log files. And then from those log files, um, run a Nix build. Uh, so in the case of uh, uh, Python support, you get the requirements.txt or a list of requirements that you get otherwise, or a pyproject.toml. Uh, you run its special locking script. It will call pip, ask it what it would have installed in its dry run, uh, write that down into a log.json, and then later you can feed that same log.json to a Nix build and get the exact uh, set of packages that you were expecting into a Python environment. And this uses um, basically, um, the upstream infrastructure for Python, so um, it has it, it works for everything because it uh, usually just downloads binary wheels, which are pre-compiled for other people. Uh, so that's nice. As I said, it has a module system, so this is an example of how you would use it for pip. You just have a set of configuration, um, you specify requirements file, then you say, OK, I want a Python environment for this. And then you get a Python environment after some, some work uh, that has all of the dependencies that you, require, um, that you expected. And because it's a module system, you can also specify overrides, which is a really nice feature. Uh, because you know, sometimes the um, dependencies aren't really used to being installed in the sandbox, or you need to uh, patch them to be a bit smaller and not to um, require certain things. So, yeah, that works, and that's step one of my plan. So how do we run this in Docker? Of course, there's Docker tools, which has been available for years now. Um, there's Docker tools for built image. Uh, you can generate 
um, image with that. So you do Nix build, you get a four gigabyte uh, binary blob, you can call Docker load on that, then that four gigabyte binary blob is in your Nix store forever. Uh, then you change three lines of code somewhere and you get a new four gigabyte binary blob in your Nix store. Uh, so you run out of disk space quite fast, but it's nice because you can just chip the binary blob and that works. Um, I think later someone wrote uh, Docker tools .stream layered image. And instead of generating a binary blob, it generates a script that generates a binary blob. <laughs> which, is, yeah, which is actually quite better because the binary blob doesn't end in your next storm. Um, and you can, it also has some, some uh, JSON specification that tells the script which exact layers to put in the, um, in, into the stream. And you can just stream the result into Docker load. You can, uh, um, you can stream it into um, Scopeo to just push it to the cloud without having Docker on the system. So I integrated that into dream to nix I wrote a module where you can generate Docker images in the module system. So uh, that seemed to work. I, have, I now have a dream to nix module for the Python environment. I have a dream to nix module for the uh, Docker image. Then I get some feedback from users. Um, the locking step turns out to be really slow. And the image generation turns out to also be really slow. So let me start with the image generation. Um, it turns out that this first reads all of the files that it's going to put in the image. Uh, it, comp it computes a hash for them and then uh, rereads all of those files that it's going to put in the image to stream them to Docker, even if they already are in the Docker store. So I worked on that with a friend and we ported the Python script to Go and used um, container utils from Google to uh, make this a lot faster and to only read it once and to only read the parts that aren't in the Docker store or in the remote yet. So that saved a lot of time. Um, then we got the complaint that running the locking process is quite slow. Of course, this calls pip and pip downloads a bunch of stuff from the internet. And then it's not really meant to do this, but it can do this. Um, so we instead used UV, which is a newfangled tool to um, really quickly install Python packages. So we had to patch it a bit to generate the log.json. It's uh, really annoying, but it works, and it's a lot faster in the runtime step. Uh, so users are happy that they only have to compile 400 Rust packages instead of just waiting for a tiny bit of, uh, byte, uh, of, of pip to run. So we should fix that with some cache, but for now, uh, it works for iteration. Uh, then we got some more feedback. Uh, the images are sometimes really, really big. Of course, we have Nix. We know the dependency graph of our entire image. So we can see where this comes from. So I had to write a visualizer for that. Um, it uh, takes your entire Nix closure and it tells you which parts are the big parts. In this case, it's Torch. I can zoom in and you can see that it's because Torch includes another copy of CUDA that we already had and a bunch of stuff that we don't need. So that's where the patching comes in, you can, uh, the overriding comes in, you can just patch it out and it will be a lot um, smaller. So that's all of my problems dealt with. Um, this has some nice other properties because if you run Docker, you, it generates a layer for every um, command that you run in the Docker file where this generates a layer for um, every package that's in the uh, Docker file. Uh, so we can share this across multiple images and get a bit faster uh, startups for that. We can also, instead of taking Python packages, do some custom Nix builds. So we have the full power of Nix available to do weird uh, compiles from Nightlies. If we need that, we can compile Torch to be a lot smaller because we don't need all of the kernels for older GPUs, for example. So we use this in production and it uh, works quite well. Um, so, but still there's much to do from my side. Um, at least I hope I got you excited about the power of dream to nix in this. And um, I have some ideas uh, for the hackathon. If you don't have any yourselves, uh, you can try out dream to nix, uh, contribute to that and help me upstream some of the bits that I wrote for this. And uh, that's it. And does anyone have any questions?
Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. I, I, the last time I used Dream to Nix, I thought it was called Dream to Nix because it took eight hours for that lock valve generation. <laughs> and so I went to bed and woke up and it was done. And it worked perfectly, by the way. So thank you for doing that. Um, how has the patching part been? That's one of my biggest concerns with Dream to Nix is that I don't want... I don't want the pre-built wheels to bring their own CUDA, et cetera, et cetera. How has that experience been for you in trying to make it compatible with the Nix versions of various dependencies, like system dependencies? Um, so recently, um, a bunch of the Torch wheels uh, stopped shipping their own CUDA. They now have a bunch of um, CUDA packages inside of uh, PyP, um, which sounds horrible, but it's actually kind of nice because you can just um, override those to say, instead of shipping your own CUDA, I want mine. Um, so yeah, it's getting better um, for t through no fault of my own. Um, so that's quite nice. And for other dependencies, yeah, sometimes you have to specify, OK, this package needs OpenMPI to, to run. And OpenMPI then needs SSH to be present in the image. So yeah, we're just collecting a bunch of overrides until it all works. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, my question continues a little bit on the previous uh, remark. Um, how do you deal, uh, in my um, experience, Python ships a lot of random hidden system dependencies. You install something, it randomly breaks because you miss something. You find out what that uh, entails. You install that, it breaks again. So is that the only, um, and I was wondering how dream 2 nix solves this problem or doesn't solve that problem. Uh, yeah, it sort of have solved this problem uh, because um, there are, are some overrides mechanisms that you can just yeah. collect overrides for every sort of package uh, that needs some system dependency. I think DreamTunix also has a way to uh, take all of the overrides that are already applied in the uh, Nix packages Python um, system and apply that to DreamTunix. Uh, but yeah, it still exists and it's still sometimes annoying to do dependency discovery. But I've seen that this is also the case if you just pip install because it will say, okay, you need OpenMPI and then you install OpenMPI, it's the wrong one. Um, so at least we only have to figure this out once instead of for every pip install run. Thanks. Hi. Two quick questions. Uh, first one, the name of that uh, visualizer tool you said you wrote, is that available in, for the rest of us as well? Um, so I want to work on that on the hackathon. Uh, currently, it's um, some Node.js to take the um, Nix closure dump file um, and some observable plot code to uh, visualize that. But I've used it a lot, and it's really nice. So it would be nice if it was available for the rest of the world. All right. Second question, which is a bit broader one. Uh, UV and other package managers, Cargo for example, they try to boast, we have reproducible log files. So why is StreamTunix writing its own instead of just using theirs? Um, when I started with this, uh, UV didn't have any reproducible log files yet. Um, also, I've worked on Nix npm build package, which uses the reproducible log files from Yarn and from npm. And it turns out that those formats aren't really all that stable. So at some point, they do some optimization, and they say, OK, that's stop hatching uh, Git dependencies, for example, uh, which was a real problem with Yarn, I think. Or they switch to some SHA version that's not supported in Nix. Uh, or they don't use JSON, but they use some custom format. So that's why I think it's nice that uh, dream to nix just uses its own log files. All right, thank you very much. Quick one, the stream layer image, uh, yeah, we also have speed problems with that one. For the Go, the lazy one, does it still work with, uh, with just piping it to Docker load? Uh, yeah, but it's not as fast because it still has to um, write, uh, read all of, the, all of the files on the next store. So but it still works. Uh, you can still generate streams with that. So it should be a drop-in replacement, I suppose. Um, well, not exactly, because um, the way that Go generates tarballs and the way that Python generates tarballs is not quite compatible, so the hash ends up differently. Right. Any more questions? Right. Um, 
So now that you suffer this nightmare, uh, <laughs> what would be your uh, point if you could talk to some guy packaging that uh, that, that software in the first place? What what should you recommend to to them? I actually don't know. I think they're doing their best. Um, but if you have a pip package, um, you want to be able to write that for the largest possible audience. So you try to probably support Ubuntu or Debian. And I'm not really sure what you can do to make it better for us next people. I think you can uh, properly specify your dependencies or even check your dependencies and give nice error messages instead of something that you Google and you don't find that it's missing, SSH, for example. But yeah, no, no, no real breakthroughs there. And the next two container uh, project is trying to, or is, is improving the stream layered image. Uh, do you know this project and did you try it? Um, so I looked briefly into all of the different ways that you can um, build uh, Nix containers with Docker, uh, sorry, uh, Docker containers with Nix, um, and they all seem to be a bit hard to compare. So I, I just basically wrote my own, well, I hope that I can upstream this into Nix packages and make just Docker tools better for everyone. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what's, why I didn't use that, but I just saw a few different things, and some of them were recently written, some of them were old, and with the old ones I thought, I'm not sure if that's maintained, and with the ones that were recently written, I was like, oh, that might not be done yet. So, um, not sure if there's a middle ground there. Uh, it's probably more a comment than a, uh, than a question, but you mentioned you have problems with OpenMPI having the wrong version and so on, and especially that you always need this uh, open SSH in the enclosure. But I think we should talk about that because there might be ways to suppress that actually. Yeah, nice. So that you can reduce the closure size. Right, so I'm, I'm assuming that Nix has only one version of everything that you said, like packages have one version? Uh, what I mean is um, you have in um, Nix packages, if you look at one specific version of Nix packages, it just has uh, about uh, one, sometimes maybe two, if that's needed for compatible uh, for compatibility Python um, uh, packages. So if you look at something, let me see if I can find it on my slides. Yeah. If you're looking for like sentence piece, then there's probably just one version of sentence piece for your specific version of Nix packages. Right, and pip or conda or whatever other package managers, they have plenty of versions apparently, right? Yeah. Is there a reason why Nix has only one version? Is, is that the idea to have multiple ones? I think it's mostly because it's um, manual labor to write multiple ones, and Nix tries, uh, Nix package just tries not to be too big in this and just use one version and make everything else compatible with that. And sometimes, I think a few times per year, someone tries to update all of the Python, and um, it's a huge pull request. And sometimes people try to update one or two packages, but. Yeah. Right, but as long as people keep writing dependencies.txt that look like that, there is not going to be a way to, to do Python support from Nix if people keep asking for very particular versions, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's the same in Rust or in Haskell or in uh, JavaScript. People want specific versions of things, and the package managers just uh, give you their own so there is no way out, basically. So you have to keep using people, basically. Uh, I think there might be another talk about this, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Um, so, so I also tried the uh, stream layered uh, images, and I found some uh, weird limits with uh, hard coded 100 layers per uh, image. Did you encounter that and do you have workarounds or what, um, what should we do? Yeah, um, so you said uh, stream layered image, it only outputs about 100 layers. If you have 200 dependencies, then it will tend to throw all of your packages into the last layer. Um, I had some workaround for that. I just wrote a script to merge all of the smallest layers together um, so that the bigger packages ended up in their own layer. Um, 
which is also nice to upstream maybe, but it was a quick hack, so I'm not sure if that works uh, really well. Okay then, if there are no more questions left, let's thank our speaker again.